Hundreds of years before Jesus died on the cross on that spring day in Jerusalem, God wrote through his prophet Isaiah a more vivid description of his son's crucifixion than is found anywhere else in the Bible, and we study it today in Isaiah 53. Welcome to Through the Bible with our teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee. I'm Steve Schwetz, inviting you to hop aboard the Bible bus for another great study in God's Word. Now, in the Gospels, we're not told too many details about Jesus' death. The Holy Spirit spared us those morbid details. Interestingly, it's Isaiah who paints the grotesque picture. But even then, we really can't know, even to eternity, all that Jesus endured in obedience to the Father and what God demanded of Jesus out of his love for you and me. Today, we get a new perspective on what John 3.16 described as the reason for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Let's pray and begin this amazing and humbling study. Heavenly Father, your love for us stuns us into silence. Thank you for your Son and his sacrificial death on the cross. Help us, Lord, to grow deeper in our comprehension of his holy mystery. In his precious name we pray. Amen. Here's Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now, friends, we're still in this very marvelous 53rd chapter of Isaiah, one of the great chapters of the Bible and is so conceded, I think, by all schools of interpretation. Now, we left off last time with the statement in the fifth and sixth verses, and let me read this again to you. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we're healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Now, this is a very wonderful passage of Scripture, and I think there are several things that we need to note here, and we'll come to one or two of them later. But right now, let me say that when it says, with his stripes we are healed, now the question arises, what are we healed of? Are we healed of physical diseases? Is that the primary meaning of it. Well, I'm going to let Simon Peter interpret this by the inspiration of the Spirit of God. For over in 1 Peter, the second chapter, verse 24, he says, "...who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness by whose stripes..." We are healed. Healed of what? Well, of our sins. We're dead in trespasses and sins. Now, we've been healed of those. That is the primary meaning here of this. Now, we are told here, and this sixth verse is a marvelous verse. Have you noticed it begins with all? It ends with all. All we like sheep have gone astray. Not some of us, but all of us. And what is the problem? What is really the problem with mankind today? The problem with you and with me. It's stated right here in this clause. We have turned everyone to his own way. That's the problem. Man has gone his way, neglected God's way, And the Scripture further says there is a way that seemeth right unto man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. And we're told today that in all our ways we're to acknowledge him, and he'll direct our paths. But our problem is we've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. 
No man cometh to the Father but by me. Now, when he died upon the cross, this passage makes it clear that he was merely taking your place and mine. He'd done nothing amiss. He was holy, harmless, and undefiled and separate from sinners. He was a substitute that the love of God provided for you and me so that he might save us. Surely our hearts go out in sympathy to him as he expires there upon the tree. Certainly we're not unmoved at such pain and suffering. We would be cold-blooded indeed if we were not responsive in our own hearts. It is said that when Clovis, the leader of the Franks, was told about the crucifixion of Christ, He was so moved that he leaped to his feet, drew his sword, and exclaimed, If I'd only been there with my Franks! Yet, my friend, Christ does not want your sympathy. He did not die to win that. He didn't die to enlist you in his defense at all. That does not enter into it. When our Lord passed by on the way to the cross, women of Jerusalem were weeping. He says, Weep not for me but weep for yourselves. Because if they do this in a live tree, what will they do with a dead one, you see? They would even take the Son of God and treat him like that. Now, he's not after your sympathy. Well, may I say that our hearts may go out in sympathy to him as he expires there, and we certainly are not unmoved by it, but he didn't die to win our sympathy. Now, someone may be thinking that he died a martyr's death. He did not die a martyr's death, for he did not espouse a lost cause. He did not die as martyrs, who in their death sang praises of joy and confessed that Christ was standing by him. Compare his death to that of Stephen, where Stephen in triumph says, I see Jesus standing at the right hand of God, and he asked God to forgive those that were stoning him. But our Lord didn't die like that. He was forsaken of God. He said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? His death was different. He died alone. He died alone with the sins of the world upon him. Now, someone else may feel like saying, Well, what a wonderful influence the death of Christ should exercise upon our lives as we contemplate his life and death. Most assuredly, we ought to be persuaded to turn from sin. However, that just has not been the experience of man. And by the way, how has it worked in your life? That view will not satisfy us. An explanation of some other statements in this chapter. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. None of these will suffice to explain his death, for he's the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. He died for you and me. He took our place. Now we turn in this chapter to that which is the satisfaction of the Savior. And here is something else that is said. He's identified as a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Now the inference is drawn from this statement that Christ was a very unhappy man while here upon earth. And to fortify this position, a few isolated incidents are quoted where it says that he wept. Well, I want to correct that if I can. You read on here in Isaiah 53. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. You see, it was our sorrow and our grief that he bore He had no grief or sorrow of his own. He was supremely happy in his mission here upon earth, for it said of him, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. May I say, these pictures that show him long face and very solemn, they misrepresent him. Even on the cross, joyfully he took our place, and he made that cross an altar on which was offered a satisfactory payment for the penalty of your sins and mine. Willingly he died there, for its father stated, as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, he opened not his mouth. Perhaps you're saying just now to yourself, preacher, that does not make sense to me. 
I do not believe that, nor do I care for that sort of religion. I do not want God to make a sacrifice for me. I did not ask him to do it. Well, it is true, my friend, that you did not ask him to do it. But let me ask you a very plain and fair question. I'm sure that you'll agree that man has got this world into a very sad predicament today. The wisdom of man has failed to settle the issues of this life. Now, had you ever thought that perhaps man may be wrong about the next life when he dismisses God's remedy with a snap of his fingers? Vain philosophy and a false science have not solved the problems of daily living today. Well, they may be wrong about the Bible also. They've been wrong in so many other areas. Now, suppose for a moment that God did give his son to die for you, and he did make such a tremendous sacrifice. Grant that the cross is God's remedy for the sin of the world, and that it is the very best that even God can do. Now, suppose also that you go on rejecting his proffered and gracious offer of salvation. Do you think that you can reasonably expect God to do anything for you in eternity? If God exhausted his love, his wisdom, and his power in giving Christ to die and patiently has waited for you to turn to him, what else can he do to save you? What do you suppose God can do for you when you reject his son who died for you? He would come again right at this moment and die again if that were needed to save you. It's no light thing, my friend, to turn down God's love gift to you. Now, that doesn't end the gospel story. We do not worship a dead Christ, but a living one. He not only died, he rose again from the grave in victory. He ascended back into heaven. At this moment, he's sitting at God's right hand, and the prophet says, He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. That's verse 11 here. We have a living and rejoicing Savior, for his suffering led to satisfaction. He took our hell that we might have his heaven. He is happy. For down through the ages, multitudes, yea, millions, have come to him and found sweet release from guilt, pardon for wrongdoing, and healing from the leprosy of sin. Christ said there's joy in heaven over one sinner that repenteth, and that number can be multiplied by millions. Think of the joy and satisfaction of Christ today. Friends, we have a happy Christ, a joyful Christ, and it's going to be fun to be in his presence. You can bring added joy to his heart. Those of you that are listening today that have not accepted him, all you have to do right where you are is to accept the gift of eternal life that he longs to give you. He's not asking anything of you. He wants to give you something. He invites you to the foot of his cross. And this is where you will find forgiveness of your sins. And it's to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly. His faith is counted for righteousness. And may this be your prayer and mine. Beneath the cross of Jesus... I fain would take my stand, the shadow of a mighty rock within a weary land, a home within the wilderness, a rest upon the way from the burning of the noontide heat and the burden of the day. Upon that cross of Jesus, mine eye at times can see the very dying form of one who suffered there for me. And from my smitten heart with tears to wonders, I confess the wonders of redeeming love and my unworthiness. Oh, what a marvelous, marvelous prayer that is for a sinner to pray. That brings us now to chapter 54. And chapter 54 is a very logical chapter to follow here because... 
we have the song that accompanies salvation and the future glories of Israel here. Because you see, the Redeemer is coming to Zion. And someday they are going to behold him and ask him, What mean those nail prints in your hands? He said, I receive those in the house of my friend. And there is to be great joy. So this next chapter opens with a song. Sing, O barren, verse 1. And he's talking here directly to Israel. And he's talking to you and to me. Now, I can't sing. Maybe you can. And if you can, that's wonderful. But I'm going to be able to sing someday. And today, I'm very happy that he says to make melody in your heart. I'm really in tune in my heart. But I've somehow or another never been able to get the mouth in tune. But this is a marvelous passage now. You see, redemption brings a song into the world. All that the world can produce is the blues and rock music. Not pretty. (laughs) Not really joyful. It's always a plaintiff note. And I want to tell you, it's only redemption that can give you a song. And here we have it. The world sings the blues. The redeemed sing of blessings. The world has its rock and roll. The redeemed sing of redemption. The world plays jazz. The redeemed have the reality of joy. And so there follows the sacrificial sufferings of the servant in chapter 53. Now chapter 54, that opens with a great hallelujah chorus. And someday we're going to all join in this. It's in Revelation 5, verses 9 and 10. And they sung a new song. Well, it's going to be a new song because you and I both are going to be able to sing it. And it's going to be new for me. Thou art worthy to take the book, to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and hast made us unto our God a kingdom of priests, and we shall reign on the earth. What a picture you have here. You see, this is the church that's mentioned in Revelation. But here in the 54th of Isaiah, why, it is the nation Israel. The church is a chaste virgin. Here you have a restored wife. And I read now the rest of verse 1, because we have now in the first 10 verses the regathering and restoration of Israel as the desolate wife of Jehovah. Sing, O barren, thou that didst not bear, break forth into singing and cry aloud, thou that didst not travail with child. For more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife, saith the Lord. Now you have here this wonderful song. And I think you see it in miniature in the life of Sarah. Here is Sarah, barren, childless, and an old woman, 80 years old, no children. And now God makes the barren to bring forth. And just think of the millions that have come from her. May I say to you, that's the reason God's given us that story, is to let us know here. So the first word after the crucifixion in Isaiah 53 is sing. And it's a call to Israel to sing. But they're not singing over there today. In the past, Israel has been a barren wife, but out yonder in the future. Her travailing is over, because her travailing so far has only produced wind like the mountain that travailed and brought forth a mouse. But her future is more glorious as there are going to be many children in the future. The Word of God makes it clear that the great days are right down yonder ahead of us. It gets gooder and gooder all the way along if you're a child of God. Today's better than yesterday. And you want to know something? Tomorrow's going to be better than today. Can't have it any more wonderful than this, friends. Verse 2, Enlarge the place of thy tent, and let them stretch forth the curtains of thine habitations. Spare not, lengthen thy cords, and strengthen thy stakes. 
Now, the nation Israel has never occupied the entire land that God has given to them. The land that God marked out for them, and you'll find it in Joshua 1, 4, it was about 300,000 square miles. Even in their heyday, when they reached the zenith under David and Solomon, they only occupied 30,000 square miles. Quite a difference. Now God says, you're going to lengthen your cords and strengthen your state. You're going to be safe in that land. We won't need to be afraid of the Arab in that day. And during the millennium, they're going to occupy the total borders. And the city of Jerusalem was going to have large suburban areas and no traffic jams. Now, how the Lord will work that out, don't ask me. I don't know, but he's going to work it out. Verse 3, For thou shalt break forth on the right hand and on the left, and thy seed shall inherit the Gentiles and make the desolate cities to be inhabited. Now, the Gentiles have occupied most of the land of promise. They have it today. And they're going to withdraw to their own borders. The whole problem in the world today is that not only are individuals trying to step over in somebody's territory, but nations are trying to expand their borders too. That's caused the problem in this world today. You remember James in a practical way said... We just keep on wanting more and more and more. And that's what produces wars. Now he goes on here, verse 5, For thy makers, thine husband, the Lord of hosts, is his name, and thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the God of the whole earth, shall he be called. Now, God will own them as his redeemed in that day. Now we are told in verse 6, For the Lord hath called thee as a woman forsaken, Grieved in spirit, and a wife of youth, when thou wast refused, saith the Lord. Now, Israel is today like a wife that has been divorced for adultery. That's the figure of speech that's used. And when you have a figure of speech like that, a type, don't try to push them too far, because they merely illustrate in one particular area. Now he says, For a small moment have I forsaken thee, but with great mercies will I gather thee. Now, that's verse 7 here, chapter 54. And in that day, we're going to look back, all of us, not only Israel, and we're going to look at what we thought was terrible down here, but it was a light affliction, and it was just for a moment, and it's going to work for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. And we need to get our eyes on things that are not seen. We're looking at too many things that are seen today. Now, verse 10. For the mountains shall depart, the hills be removed, but my kindness shall not depart from thee. Neither shall the covenant of my peace be removed, saith the Lord, that hath mercy on thee. Now, if you feel that God's going to break his covenant he made with Abraham, an eternal covenant, Isaiah would have you know that you're wrong. God says he's not going to break that covenant, never will break it. He doesn't intend to break it. Now, we have in this last section here the rejoicing and righteousness of Israel as the restored wife. And that began here with verse 11. O thou afflicted, tossed with tempest, and not comforted, behold, I lay thy stones with fair colors, and lay thy foundations with sapphires. Verse 15, Behold, they shall surely gather together. And verse 17, and this is a marvelous verse of Scripture. Notice this, No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper, and every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. Too bad Hitler didn't read that. Too bad that Haman didn't take note of that. Too bad today that Russia didn't take note of that, or doesn't take note. And there are a lot of anti-Semites in this country ought to read that verse. God intends to do the thing he says right here. Next time now, we'll begin at chapter 55 of Isaiah. Until then, may God richly bless you, my beloved. 
What a great promise of God to Israel and to every servant of the Lord. We're coming to the end of our study in Isaiah and return to the New Testament, 1 Thessalonians to be exact, in a couple weeks. So now is a great time to visit ttb.org and download your free copy of our digital book titled Briefing the Bible. In it, you'll find all of Dr. McGee's notes and outlines for our five-year study, including those for 1 Thessalonians. Again, that address is ttb.org. Or if you'd prefer to receive an abridged copy of Briefing the Bible by mail, Use the request form online or call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE. Tomorrow, we're in Isaiah 55, so join us as the Bible bus comes back by your corner at this same time. I'm Steve Schwetz, and I'll be here saving a seat just for you. We're so grateful for the faithful and generous support of Through the Bible's partners who are being used by God to take the whole word to the whole world.